All right, take your Bibles, if you will. Turn with me to the book of 2 Kings, chapter 14. Oh my, 2 Kings, chapter number 14. What good special music. It was a blessing. We, we have been in 2 Chronicles. We've looked at King Asa, King Jehoshaphat, uh, King Jehoram, and we're going to backtrack just a little bit. We're going to go back to King Rehoboam. And uh, my, oh, my, oh, my, I wanted to not miss King Rehoboam. You know, the kings of Israel. We had King who? Saul. Remember King Saul? Then we had King David. Then we had King Solomon. And then after King Solomon, oh, my, the kingdom becomes divided. You have the northern kingdom of Israel with King Jehoram, and you have the southern kingdom, King Rehoboam. And uh, the title of the message tonight is Rehoboam, how? You can imagine saying, how did I get in such a mess? And you can hear Rehoboam, and you're going to read about his mess very shortly, but King Rehoboam got himself in a big mess. Not only himself in a big mess, but he got God's kingdom in a big mess. And Rehoboam, have you ever gotten in a big mess? Oh boy, have I ever gotten a big mess and uh, no fun and uh, maybe once getting in that mess, but help me to learn from my mistakes or better yet, help me learn from somebody else's mistakes so I don't get in a big mess. Uh, before we get to the sermon, I remember a mess that I got into. I remember desiring to take my wife Mandy fishing and uh, I didn't have a boat at the time, so a good friend of mine, Billy, I asked if I could borrow his boat. And he said, sure. And uh, I put it in the back of my truck and uh, I didn't understand the importance of tying it down. It's wedged in there. There's gonna be no problems. And I remember traveling down 264 and my wife is with me and I'm looking good. She's looking good. The boat was not looking good because it went flying up in the air, did a couple spids and landed on 264 and skidded down the highway. And uh, it wasn't good, so I pulled over to the side, got up the boat real quick, said, honey, everything's gonna be okay, you can trust me. And put it back in there. And you know how it is, you try to do something with your wife and it's gonna be fun. And then the rain starts. And it starts where I'm taking her fishing. Sure enough, we can, and honey, we're gonna be good. It's just a couple drops. And we went fishing out on a lake, Lake Prince down out in Suffolk. And we caught, I think, two fish. Uh, we got soaked, we had trash bags on us. I looked like an idiot, my wife looked beautiful. And uh, we got back in the, the uh, truck. I decided I'm gonna tie down the boat, but I'm only gonna use one strap. Can I just suggest you use more than one strap? And I tied it on one of those bungee straps, you know, the ones that stretch. And I tied it on there. We're coming back on 58, past that, you know, the, the dump that's over there. And there's a, a brother, um, you, you understand there's a tractor trailer right behind me, Brother Wilson. Yeah, it's probably you driving that behind me. And I remember the moment when that boat went flying out again attached to that rubber thing, flying right at the windshield of that tractor trailer. I could almost see his eyes go like this to like this. And as it stretched out toward him and then started coming back, praise the Lord. And I'm dragging down that boat. I was just in a mess. I was in a big mess. So understand, Rehoboam, how did, how, and the important thing, you get yourself in a mess, which is gonna happen, but you wanna think, how did I get in such a mess, because maybe it happens once, maybe twice, but please learn from your mistakes. Or better yet, part of the sermon's purpose tonight is learn from somebody else's mistakes. You're gonna see very clearly that Rehoboam got himself in a mess. Hopefully we never get in the mess that Rehoboam got into and so hopefully tonight, whether we're young or old, we can learn from King Rehoboam's mess. Let's stand for the reading of God's word. And we're going to look here in chapter 14 of, did I say 1 Kings? 1 Kings chapter, chapter 14, 1 Kings chapter 14. What I'd like to do, we're going to look at verses 21 through 24. I'll read verse 21, 
We'll read every other verse here. 1 Kings chapter 14, starting in verse number 21, almost. Did I mess it up? Don't, oh, yeah, don't look at that. It's not 2 Chronicles chapter 12 yet. And so 1 Kings chapter 14, starting in verse number 21. And Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, reigned in Judah. Rehoboam was 40 and one years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 17 years in Jerusalem, the city which the Lord uh, did choose out of all the tribes of Israel to put his name there. And his mother's name was Naamah an Ammonitist. And Judah did evil in the sight of the Lord, and they provoked him to jealousy with their sins which they had committed above all that their fathers had done. For they also built them high places and images and groves on every high hill and under every green tree. And there were also Sodomites in the land and they did according to all the abominations of the nations which the Lord cast out before the children of Israel. You continue your reading, God sends judgment on the land with Shishak, king of the Egyptians. Now, he was merciful. There's a lot more to the story we're going to look at. But you can see Rehoboam. He's God's man. He's the king of God's country, Judah. And you can look at him ruling and he can see this, man, what have I done? I'm getting attacked by the Egyptians. Boy, we got Sodomites in the land. We've got sin very prevalent. We have problems here. We have problems over there. And you can almost see him saying, how in the world did I get in such a mess? By the way, young folks especially, boy, some of the decisions you make, some of the decisions that Rehoboam made led to him being in a big mess. And hopefully, tonight you can look at some of the uh, decisions that Rehoboam made and you can say, ah, when I get to that point in my life, I'm going to be very careful of making the same mistake because I can see the end. I can see what happened to Rehoboam and I don't want to be in a mess like Rehoboam. And how did I get in this mess? Well, we're about to find out some of the nitty gritty uh, circumstances that led to King Rehoboam getting in a mess. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Father in heaven, uh, Oh, I've been planning on preaching about Rehoboam for several weeks, Lord. And uh, Lord, thank you for giving us some of the nitty gritty about what he did wrong, some of the decisions he made. And it wasn't just one decision, though one decision did have a big part in that. Help us to look at, at Rehoboam and say, wow, what a mess. But help us to apply some of the decisions he made to our life and help us to not make the same mistake. We love you, Lord. We need you in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Rebel, how did you get, you know, this sermon could be a story of me confessing the mistakes I've made in my life. But, you know, sometimes I make mistakes in my life. I pray to God, pray to God that I learn from my mistakes. Amen. Amen. And hopefully you do too. Now, one of my mistakes, Mandy and I are out and about over in the Outer Banks, uh, close to Ocracoke Island over there. And uh, we're driving back and you can drive out on the beach. And there's signs that say, don't drive out on the beach unless you have four wheel drive. And there's a nice path and I've told the story before, but I said, honey, I think we can make it. We can get over that little sand hill right there. We can make it over. We could drive on the beach. It would be romantic. And uh, romantic's a three syllable word. And my wife said, don't do it. I said, honey, watch. And sure enough, I went full speed ahead right toward the sand and uh, about, you know, halfway up, totally stuck. And my wife just gave me the look and you know the look. <laughs> and it was not good. And I got out and my, as I tried to get out of it back up, all I did was my tires just bottomed out of my truck right there. We're in the middle of nowhere. Nobody around. My wife basically said, you got us in this mess. You're going to get us out of this mess. And like you would do, uh, Brother John Solano, just like I would, we would say, yes, ma'am. Amen. And so what did I do? I prayed. I said, God, help. We're in the middle of nowhere. 
And as I'm walking toward the highway area, a man pulled off into our section and he had that knowing look that you were in trouble. And I said, you don't happen to have any pull straps or anything. He says, I do and I will help you out. And I said, praise the Lord. Now, I was in a mess, but I wanna let you know I've never taken a two wheel drive truck and tried to drive over across sin and I'll never do it again because I learned from my mistake. And we can learn from our mistakes, but better yet, let's learn from Rehoboam's mistakes, amen. Rehoboam, how did I get in such a mess? Can I, I wanna dwell on this, but it's a mess. Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, he reigned in Judah. He was 41 years of age when he began to reign. He reigned 17 years. His, his mother's name was Naamah, an Ammonitess. And the Bible says Judah did evil in the sight of the Lord. Rehoboam's kingdom that he was in charge of was literally doing evil in the sight of the Lord. They provoked the Lord our God to jealousy with the sins that they committed. And here, Rehoboam is in charge. He has a nation that is dishonoring God where sin is prevalent. They built high places. They had images that the people of God, God's people bowed down to these images and worshiped them. Groves, every high place. There were sodomites in the land. You know, he's in charge. He's in charge of the government. And the Sodomites are living there openly and unashamed. It's no big deal. The nation accepts that. There's no, hey, uh, Rehoboam saying, that's not right. We're not going to have that in our land. It was a corrupt nation. And that Rehoboam is in charge. He's leading this nation. He's the son of Solomon, the wisest man to ever live. His dad wrote the book of Proverbs. Yeah, his dad was the one that wrote the book of Ecclesiastes. That's his dad. And he led the nation to be a mess. By the way, this is serious. Sin, sin in God's land. And you know, eventually, I'm, I'm not there yet, and I wouldn't go there yet, but you know, sometimes we in our families, sometimes in our churches, in our lives, we get in a mess with sin. And we look and say, how did we get in such a mess? And you know, the Bible tells us very simply, uh, that it says then sin when it is finished, bringeth forth death. Sin's the problem. I remember talking to a man and he was a mess, a complete mess. And I don't mean to be rude to him, but he would admit he was a mess. You know, pain, physical pain, and he uh, decided that his answer was marijuana. And he, just, he would say to me, I know it's illegal, uh, family involved, uh, and he shared his wealth, his marijuana with other family members, which created a bigger mess. And then it, it led to him being pretty much homeless, living in a, uh, one of those storage units right there. And he was always miserable, always in a mess. And, and I looked at him, I said, you know, you're a mess. And he would say, I'm a mess. And he would say, I'm miserable. And I'd say, you don't have to live that way. Why are you living that way? And then he would defend his use of that illegal substance, soon to be legal in Virginia, but it's still not right, marijuana. And, and it was sad. Hey, rub on, you're in a mess. And you think about it, how did this happen? How did the land get to the point? God's country, God's people, God's land get into such a mess. How did this happen? And this is a very important part of the message. Because if we don't stop and try to think about it, why did this happen? Sometimes we're not going to be able to solve the problem. We, we need to learn from this. I, recently, one of my children was disrespectful to mama. And when uh, one of my sons is disrespectful mama bear, it makes daddy bear a little grumpy, okay? And so the problem, the disrespect to mama, I don't put up with it. I'm not gonna put up with it. And I took some time to correct it, but part of the problem was he didn't think about what he did that was disrespectful. He didn't stop to think why he was in a mess. Can I just tell you he was in a mess? Amen. He's in a mess. And so I had to stop and teach him to think about why did this happen? How did this happen? If you don't understand why this happened, you're going to continue doing the same thing. And the end result is bad. And, and I spent a lot of time. You got to think, stop for a moment and think, how did you get to this place? This is not a, a happy place that you're at, son. This is not a glorious place and I'm not filling you in on the details, but it was not a, a glorious position to be in. And you need to stop and you need to think why you're in this place so it never, ever happens again. 
Do you understand that? Rehoboam, how did this happen? Now, this is where we turn to 2 Chronicles chapter number 10. And the story goes from 2 Chronicles 10, 11, and 12. I've tried to base my message out of the, the book of Chronicles. A side note, you know, 1 Kings, 2 Kings, uh, tell us about the kings of Israel, uh, King Saul, King David, King Solomon. Then it goes into a lot of detail about Rehoboam and the northern king, Jeroboam. When you read 1 Kings you'll, and 2 Kings, you'll, you'll read about Jeroboam, the northern kingdom of Israel after the divide. The Chronicles don't spend a lot of time on the northern kings. They spend time on the southern kings, a lot of details. Very interesting because you get both perspective as what, what's going on. They're needed books. God gave them as a gift to us. 2 Chronicles chapter 10, there, this is a big portion. I'm going to start in verse 1. Now I'm going to breeze over this. If I lose you... Read it over later, okay? Rehoboam, and Rehoboam went to Shechem. For to Shechem were all Israel to come to make him king. Verse two, and it came to pass when Jeroboam, who was in Egypt, heard it that Jeroboam returned out of Egypt. I'm skipping over just a little bit for time's sake. Verse three, so Jeroboam and all Israel came and spake to Rehoboam saying, and here's the story. Uh, Solomon's dead. Who's dead? Solomon. Hey, it's time for a new king. Rehoboam, you are the man. And there's a man, there's a prophecy. We're not going to go into detail with the prophecy of Jeroboam, but he had fled from Solomon. He was in Egypt. He heard that Solomon's dead. He comes back. Uh, Jeroboam gathers a big group of people, especially the people of Israel, to come to, to Rehoboam and uh, sort of to encourage him to be a good king. Thy father made our yoke grievous. This is Jeroboam. Now therefore ease thou somewhat the grievous servitude of thy father and his heavy yoke that he put upon us and we will serve thee. Verse number five. And he said unto them, come again unto me after three days. And the people departed. So Jeroboam said, just calm down a little bit. Ease up a little bit. Be kind a little bit. Be merciful a little bit. And Rehoboam looks and he says, come back in three days and I'll let you know what I decide as the king we know this story. It's a wonderful story, a sad story. But, but Rehoboam, in the end, listened to the wrong people. He went to the older folks, and he took counsel with the old men and had, had stood before Solomon, his father, while he yet lived, saying, What counsel give ye me to return answer to this people? They spake unto him, If thou be kind to this people and please them and speak good words to them, they will be thy servants forever. And you understand, he went to the wise people and they said, Be kind to the people. Love the people. Take care of the people. If, you, if you're kind to them, you love them, Rehoboam, they're going to follow you as king. And you understand, God's put you here as a king. We want you to, to, to be a good king. And, and if you just are kind to the people, good to the people. And the old men are giving them good advice. These are godly men. These are counselors that were there for Solomon. And, and such a sad story. We, we've heard this, most of us have heard this a hundred times, but he forsook the counsel which the old men gave him, verse eight. And it says, and took counsel with young men that were brought up with him that stood before him. And he said to them, what advice give ye me that we return answer to this people which is spoke? He's asking the young people. Rehoboam goes to the young buckarooskies that he grew up. He says, you know, I'm the king, guys. <laughs> Man, it's great being king. <laughs> and, and, you know, he's living it up. I got power. I got authority. You know, guys, the, the, the people are coming up to me asking me for some favors. They're saying lighten the load a little bit. I went to those old fogies over there and I asked them, what should I do? And you know what they told me to do? They told me to love the people, be nice to the people. And you know, what do you guys think this powerful, mighty king ought to do? You can see the picture. And the young buck says, you're the king. I mean, Rebone, you're the king. <laughs> king, you got power. You got ability. You need to take that power and you need to let them know who you are. Put it on them. And, and by the way, it goes into details. And I'm making light of it, but it's so sad. You know, a side note, a side note, you wish that Rehoboam went to those young guys, maybe with that attitude, I can imagine it like that, and you wish, you wish one of those people would say, Rehoboam, knock it off. 
Knock it off, Rehoboam. Don't you know that those were the counselors to your dad, the king, who was the wisest man to ever live? Smack, 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 Kingo. Hey, get right. Hey, don't you act like that knucklehead. You wish that would have happened. By the way, can I just say, if somebody, you're, you're a young buckaroo, and you know, your mama or daddy tells you something and says, you know, you gotta be careful of this situation. And then you listen to them, you hear what's said, the wisdom that's been given to you, somebody that loves God, loves the God of the Bible, loves the Bible uh, that God has given them. And then you go to one of your young buckaroos, you say, well, what should I do? You know, you know what you gotta tell them? Listen to your mom, Amen. listen to your dad, listen to your pastor. Boy, they've given you advice that's godly, that's right. Who am I? What do I know at eight years of age or 11 years of age or 14 years of age? In, in truth, let, say it kindly. You don't know nothing. You don't have the experience. You don't know the danger that's right around the corner. And, and you, you're going to look back and say, man, what an idiot I was. I should have said, listen to your mama. Listen to your daddy. Listen to your pastor. Hey, thus saith the Lord. Hey, remember that. You should tell them. Remember the story of Rehoboam. Wake up. Wake up. But sad fact is sometimes those guys, they tickle the ears of the king. They begin to say, be hard on them. And, and number one, the, the, thing, the thing that Solomon did that got him in such a mess was he listened to the wrong people. He listened to the wrong people. The, the story continues, and it, it's so sad. He listened to the wrong people people and we could go into more and more detail on this and uh, it, it continues on it's just sad Jeroboam and all the people came to Rehoboam the king answered them roughly he forsook the counsel of the old men he answered them after the advice of the young men my father made your yoke heavy but I will add there too my father chastised you with whips but I'm going to chastise you with scorpions <laughs> And imagine the old men in the background saying, oh boy, this is not good for our kingdom. This is not good. And by the way, they, how do they know that? Because thy word, the, the, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light in my path. The, the Bible shows you where you're going. It, it, it predicts the future. And you can see those old men saying, don't do it. Don't do it. Don't do it. But Rehoboam, hmm, he listened to the wrong people. And, and I'm not meaning to get to my message yet, but you, you know, you want to prevent yourself from getting in the mess? Listen to the right people. Amen. That needs to be shouted and told. Listen to godly people. Listen to your mom and dad who love you, who care for you. Listen to people who love God's word, people who love the Bible, people who are faithful to church, people who uh, love the preaching of God's word. Listen to godly people. Listen to godly people. Listen to godly people. Listen to godly people. Please listen to godly people. By the way, it leads to a question. Who are you listening to? That's a good question. And you know, whether you're 80 or you're 50 or you're 20 or you're 14 or you're 10 or you're eight, who are you listening to? Uh, man, alive. Pastor Fugit, who comes and preaches for us, and he's been a good friend to not only me, but to our church. And part of the background, he's a good preacher. I like his preaching. And I like him coming out here and us being influenced by his preaching of God's word. However, comma, there's another side benefit that I get when he comes out here. Imagine the time I spend with him in the, the car. When I sit down with lunch at him, I go and ask counsel. He's a man of God. He's a man that's led a church for many, many years. And I ask him questions about this ministry. I ask him as an old older man to guide me and to direct me. Do you understand that? Brother Payton, you remember. You remember I asked him about our building program probably eight or nine years ago. I said, Pastor Fugit, look at this building we're going to build right over there. We're going to build a new nursery with a Sunday school room. And we had plans made. And I remember Brother Fugit said, uh, well, Brother Matt, let me talk to you about this. Have you thought about what you're doing, where you're leading the church? Have you thought about it might be more profitable to build the building that we're in? 
And all of a sudden, he put a wrench into my thinking. I was so excited. But then I began to stop and say, Lord, give me wisdom in this area. Brother Payton, you remember the conversation. And we had to halt. And not only I had to halt, Brother Payton had to halt, but a whole congregation had to stop and almost do a U-turn. Why did that happen? Well, I was seeking counsel from a, a wise man. The pastor, you should have asked him a year earlier. Probably should have. But praise God, when I did ask him and I figured out, I was able to stop and listen to him. Ah, I, I, there's so many stories. But I think about my marriage. Years before I met Mandy, I was dating a girl. And things were not right. But what did I do there? I knew something wasn't right. And I talked to my pastor. Why did I talk to my pastor? He's a godly man. Why did I talk to my pastor? He loves God's word. Why did I talk to my pastor? He was years in front of me. And, and he gave me some ways. He said, if you're doubting this or if you're having some hesitancies about this, hey, don't get married yet. Wait. And by the way, is that what I wanted to hear? No. But was he right? Yes. And it changed the course of my life in a good way, listening to wise counsel. Why did it happen? Revon, why did I get myself in this mess? Look at 2 Chronicles chapter 11. Look at this. This, you got to pay attention to this. This is amazing. When you look at this, and I'm going to read this a little bit slowly, but please pay attention or I'm going to pull my hair out. What little hair I have left. Verse 13, chapter 11, verse 13. And the priests and the Levites that were in all Israel resorted to him out of all their coasts. For the Levites left their suburbs and their possession and came to Jeru Judah and Jerusalem. Why? For Jeroboam and his sons had cast them off from executing the priest's office under the Lord. Now stop. The divided kingdom. There's Jeroboam in the north. He doesn't want people to go down to Jerusalem because he doesn't want to have any dealings with the southern kingdom. So he sets up false gods in Bethel. He sets false gods up in Dan. And then he gets rid of the priests, the godly people of the country. He says, get out of here. And the Levites and the priests are basically maybe running for their life, but they come down to Jerusalem. They come down into the reign of Rehoboam. Do you understand that? And it continues. And he ordained him priests for the high places and for the, and for the devils and for the calves which he made unto this, that's Jeroboam. And after them, out of all the tribes of Israel, such as set their heart to seek the Lord God of Israel. Came, look at the verse 16. And after them, out of all the tribes of Israel, such as set their hearts to seek the Lord God of Israel, came to Jerusalem. Rehoboam had an, uh, an influx of godly people come into the land. Do you understand that? These are people who love God who are living for the Lord. They're no longer wanted in Israel, so they run to Jerusalem. These are good people. And then, it looks like, look at verse 17. So they strengthened the kingdom of Judah. So these priests, these Levites, came down from Israel, and they strengthened Judah. That's where Rehoboam is. Do you understand that? And made Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, strong. What made him strong? God's people. What made him strong? People who love God. Uh, what made him strong? Uh, man, these Levites and these priests coming down that love God's word and love the God of the Bible. It says strong three years. For three years they walked in the way of David and Solomon. Now at this point, number two, Rehoboam, you didn't realize how good you had it. All of a sudden he's got God's kingdom. He's on the throne. He's got a little power. Next thing you know, these godly men, uh, priests, become to come into the land and God blesses the nation because of these priests and these Levites that love him, love God, and seek the Lord God. And here, the benefit is Rehoboam, despite of the mess that he's not listening to the old men, he is blessed. All around him, he is being blessed because of these priests and these Levites. Rehoboam, you don't even realize how good you have it. Rehoboam, can't you see the blessings? Not from you. But boy, oh boy, God's people who love God, God's blessing our nation because they have a heart for God. Now, it only lasted three years. You understand? But praise God for those three years. 
And during those three years, Rehoboam was mightily, mightily blessed of the Lord. Oh my. You know, in church, you know, you think about it, especially some of your younger folks, if you don't realize it, you might not realize how good we have it here at Chesapeake Baptist Church. And I don't mean to overemphasize that wonderful orchestra and the wonderful choir and the special music. Well, God's hand of blessing is upon our church because there's men and women. Sometimes it's your mom and your dad, your grandma, your grandpa who love God, love the Bible, and God blesses our church because of that. Amen. Boy, the soul winners in this church, God blesses our church because of that. And you people who love God's word, who read God's word, who live for God's word, who serve the, the God of the Bible, God's hand of blessing is upon our church. And listen, in, in the midst of it, you may not be right with God, but you're getting some of the blessings because of the people around you. You may not be right with God, but you're inheriting some of the blessings from mom, from dad, from grandpa, from grandma, from the people of the church. And Rehoboam was being blessed of the Lord. Oh, East Coast Baptist Church. Excellent conduct begins at church. That was the church I was a member of for quite some time. And uh, man, those were some days that I was there at that church and it was an exciting church. It was a blessing. Souls were being saved. We had bus routes. We had people getting saved, getting baptized. Was it a perfect church? No, but it was a good church. It was a blessed church. Those days that we spent fellowshipping together, serving the Lord together were glorious days, glorious days. Now, the people there, sometimes they didn't realize how good it was. It was good. You know, you fast forward, the church went liberal. They got away from the word of God, began to go after pleasing people. And, and in reality, it didn't happen overnight, but slowly but surely, that church lost the blessing of the Lord. And when I say lost blessing, lost God's hand of blessing on it, they lost everything. They lost their building. They left, lost their members. And a lot of it, they began to take for granted God's blessing. Well, you wish you could have yelled at Reb on, look around you. Man, praise God for those priests. Praise God for those Levites that have come this way. Hey, take care of them. Listen to them. Hey, allow them to proclaim God's word around you. But, you know, you can see it. It happened for a little bit. Those priests and those Levites had some influence for a short period of time, just three years. Rebon, you didn't know how good you had it. Now, if you look at this next part, if you look at verse number 18. Ugh. Hey, yuck. <laughs> can I do that? Yuck. You look at this. Rebon took him Mahalath. The daughter of Jeremoth, Moth, I should say Moth, it just looks more like a moth than a moth. Uh, this daughter of Jeremoth, Moth, the son of David to wife, and Abihail, the daughter of Iliab, the son of Jesse. He's beginning to list his marriages. Not marriage, but marriages. Okay, I'm gonna emphasize something. Not marriage, but marriages. Okay, not marriage, one, but many. Okay, do you understand that? And there are some issues here. Verse 19, which bear him children, Jeush and Shamariah and Zaham. Oh, verse 20. And after her, he took Maacah, the daughter of Absalom, which bear him Abijah and Attai and Ziza and Shilamith. And Rehoboam loved Maacah, the daughter of Absalom, above all his wives and his concubines. Ugh. The end, the last part, verse 23, the last few words, and he desired many wives. Ugh. Number three, Rehoboam didn't understand the importance of just having a godly wife. He didn't understand the importance of having a, that's singular, that's one, that's uno, one godly wife. His heart was messed up. He, he didn't have a, a one, he wasn't a one woman man. And his choice of women was not good. Maacah, the daughter of Absalom, Absalom did not have a heart for God, rebelled against his father. His daughter lived in that area and it looks very obvious that he was marrying not a virtuous woman, not a godly woman, but he was marrying somebody who was not helping him with his relationship with the Lord. 
Now, this seems minor, but it's huge. He didn't understand the importance, the importance of singular, a godly wife. Now, young men, a godly wife. Young ladies, a godly husband. And in God's way is the best way. Proverbs chapter 31, favor is deceitful and beauty is vain. But a woman that feareth the Lord, she shall be praised. Well, young, young men growing up, you're uh, going, one day hopefully going to be married. But listen, marry a godly woman, a virtuous woman, a Proverbs 31 woman, a woman who has a heart for God. Favor is deceitful. Beauty is vain. But a woman that feareth the Lord, she shall be praised. You young ladies. Man, I, I really, sometimes I feel bad for you young ladies. These knucklehead uh, young men of this generation who love their video games but don't love God, you know, it's sad. It is sad. We have a, a dearth of young men that love God. We have a, a dearth, meaning a drought of men that are willing to stand for truth and stand for right. We have a dearth of, of young men who are willing to work hard. Now, I didn't sing in this room. I hope you young men work hard, have a love for God. I believe that. I, I believe the young ladies here have a love for God. You realize that favor is deceitful and beauty is vain, all of that. But don't make the mistake. Boy, that, that, that uh, young lady comes up and she does, how does she do? No, 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 no. Look for a woman that loves God, that has a heart for God, that loves God with all of her heart. Young ladies, look for a man that loves God, that has a heart for God, who's a hard worker, who is a man who loves God's word. Oh, I mean, there's a million horror stories. And this is not long ago, uh, an older man told me about his daughter marrying an unbeliever. Mm. He sent her off to college. Go off to college with no guidance. Go off to college. He had no direction. And he regrets. He looks back. I sent her off to college, to a secular college, and I didn't direct and guide her. I didn't have her heart. And, and she said, figure it out. Well, she figured out. She met Prince Charming. He was very successful, very smart, but he was unsaved and an atheist. Then they got married. Oh, it's great. Wonderful, raising those children up to in an atheistic home where they don't believe in the Bible and they don't believe in the God of the Bible. And the man who told me that his heart is broken, is broken. He thinks about it all the time. He looks back and says, oh, oh, boy, I should have spent some more time guiding my daughter to see the importance of marrying a godly man. Do you understand that? And you, you look at Rehoboam. Boy, Solomon, smack, smack, smack in heaven. Hey, hey, Rehoboam, you need to marry a godly woman, a woman that loves the Lord. And we could look at uh, Solomon's sin, and it probably had an impact on him, but it doesn't make it right. Hey, Rehoboam, marry a godly woman. Look at this one. Chapter 12. Are we still alive? Okay, good. It's important. Rehoboam. How did you get in this mess? How did it happen? Well, he listened to the wrong people. Well, how, he, uh, we know these. Look at this one, verse one, number one. Chapter 12, verse one. And it came to pass when Rehoboam had established the kingdom and had strengthened himself, he forsook the law of the Lord and all Israel with him. He, he keeps digging a little bit deeper. He keeps going the wrong direction faster. Uh, next one, how did it happen? Well, simply Rehoboam forsook the Lord. You, you think about that word forsook, uh, it means he quit. He left entirely. He deserted. He abandoned. He departed from God. You think about Rehoboam, what did he do? He said, God, I don't need you anymore. God, I don't want you anymore. God, I don't uh, desire to be around you anymore. I don't want to see anything that reminds you of you. That was a, a latter chapter in my life. I've turned over a new leaf, and he forsook the Lord. You, you know, that, that's very sad. The Bible tells us, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. 
You know, same story, different people happens over and 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 over. Uh, Achan, amen? Had to write God, but he forsook God. Remember that? Lot, Korah, Judas, Demas, and, and it goes down through the ages. Uh, so, you know, you can almost see the, the, the people looking at you and, and, and looking at you. You still go to church? Really? How many, how many years have you been doing this now? I mean, haven't you got enough Bible by now? Like, come on. I mean, don't you understand it's 2021? You know, and, and they'll give you a smart act look like they're better than you. They're smarter than you. And behind the scenes, their marriage is falling apart. Their kids are a mess and they're, they're a, a complete mess. But they'll give you that look. You going to church? Come on now. I mean, is that the way you treat your kids? I mean, don't you want to just have a little fun? A li you still think it's wrong to drink? I mean, aren't you living in the old ages, back in the dark ages? I mean, why don't you come out a little bit? Come on, like, really? Marriage, that's a foreign thing anymore. Commitment, that's a foreign thing. Hard work is a foreign thing. And they look at you, and they look at you serving the Lord, going to church on a Sunday night. Yes, go to church on a Sunday night. Go to church on a Wednesday night. Go out soul winning and tell people about Jesus. Live the Bible. Live for the Lord. Those knuckleheads who say to forsake God, they're wrong. And you see behind their smoke screen, it's misery and a mess. It's a mess. That, that old story my pastor used to say, and, and he, he had this young couple that came to church, and man, they were a young couple that, that uh, were introduced to the Lord down in Texas, and they got saved. And they started coming to church Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night, learning the Bible, and they began to serve in the church as Sunday school teachers. He became the Sunday school intended, superintendent, and they were like the core family in the church year after year, and then there came that time he got that promotion at church. And that promotion began to take him away from Sunday night church. And then all of a sudden his heart began to go away from the God of the Bible. He began to forsake God. And the pastor said, hey, hey, uh, don't you know the importance of your family being in church? He took his Sunday school superintendent book, he threw it on the desk, and he said, I don't need that anymore. You know, you, you put too much responsibility on me. Wonderful wife, wonderful children, and the family quit church. And years later, he got a, a letter in the mail from a prison. And in the letter was a letter from that man. And you've heard the story maybe before, maybe not. But in the letter, he said, Pastor, I just want to let you know where I'm at and what happened. He said, when I uh, gave you that uh, notebook and quit as a Sunday school superintendent right there, it was one of the worst mistakes of my life. I began to pursue other things, and I began to stay away from home a lot more, thinking it was okay, but behind the scenes, my marriage began to start to crumble. We were no longer dedicated to the Lord. We forsook uh, the Lord God of the Bible, and the story is sad because he came home from one of his trips and caught his wife cheating on him, and he chased him down and killed his, not his wife, but he killed that man, and he's thrown in prison from that. And in the end of the letter, he says, the, the mistake uh, started when I began to forsake the things of God. But that, that story, it sounds dramatic, and it is dramatic, but that story can be told a thousand different ways with a thousand different peoples. The end result is always bad. Hey, Rehoboam, don't forsake the Lord. Look at this next one, verse 2. Chapter 12, verse 2. And it came to pass that in the fifth year of King Rehoboam, Shishak, king of Egypt, came up against uh, Jerusalem. Why? Because they had transgressed against the Lord. So God allowed Shishak to come up. And then look at this, verse five, there's a prophet. Then came Shemaiah, the prophet, to Rehoboam. Verse five, middle way part. Thus saith the Lord, ye have forsaken me, and therefore have I also left you in the, uh, in the hand of Shishak. Verse six, whereupon the princes of Israel and the king humbled themselves and they said the Lord is righteous and you, you read over the next few chapters it's like Rehoboam says you're right and he humbles himself but he goes back and forth back and forth back and forth to humbling himself with serving the Lord back to his sin to humbling himself to back to living in sin and humbling himself in, in other words Rehoboam you lived a wishy-washy life you were wishy-washy Wishy-washy, is that an okay word to use? Wishy-washy. 
Uh, another term for that would be you were neither hot nor cold. And you were sort of lukewarm, like it says in the book of Revelation right there. And, and you know, Rehoboam, he would all of a sudden hear the prophet, and then he'd humble himself when Shishak was coming. But when Shishak steals the gold and everything out of the, the temple and all of that, he builds the, uh, the brass uh, instruments inside or the different things inside the temple right there. And all of a sudden he comes out of his humbleness, and all of a sudden I'm the king again, back to serving the false gods again. And there's a, a back and forth. He's wishy-washy. Now, this happens a lot. Pastor, pastor, I'm struggling. And I'll say, well, why are you struggling? Well, pastor, I know I should be in church. I know I should be praying. I know I should be reading my Bible. I know, I, I, well, get right. Read your Bible. Come to church. Uh, pray. Spend time with God. It will help you. What's, uh, his delight is in the law of the Lord. And then, you know, they'll get on fire for God for one service <laughs> or two maybe. I mean, we've all seen that. And that may happen. It's going to happen. It happens all the time. But don't let that be you. You don't be wishy-washy. Dad, your, your wife deserves, she needs a husband that is steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Well, your husband needs a wife that, that's not wishy-washy, that loves God, that's there to be a help, that has a, a good spirit to be a blessing. Boy, parents, you, your kids don't need wishy-washy parents that are in church and out of church and in church and out of church, sometimes having a Christian home, sometimes not. It, it's a mess. Rehoboam, you're in a mess. Why? You're wishy-washy. Amen? Okay. Some of you said, Pastor, that's a lot. Well, you know what the Bible does for you and me? Uh, you know, that was a lot. You know, it, it is a lot to think about bad counsel and forsaking the Lord, choosing the wrong wife, wishy-washy, all of that. And praise God, there is one verse that just sums up everything. Look at this, 2 Chronicles. I'll read verses 13 and 14. So King Rehoboam strengthened himself in Jerusalem and reigned. For Rehoboam was one and forty years old when he began to reign, and he reigned seventeen years in Jerusalem. For uh, Jerusalem, the city which the Lord had chosen out of all the tribes of Israel to put his name there, and his mother's name was Nama, and Ammonitus. Verse 14 is the key verse. And he, Rehoboam, did evil because. He did evil because. Okay, there's gonna, it's gonna fill us in. This is some reverse. It's gonna share with us the big picture problem. This is exciting. What's it going to say? And he did evil because he prepared not his heart to seek the Lord. That's an awesome verse. That, that really is a good verse if you think about it. It sort of sums up his whole problem. What's your problem, Rehoboam? Well, the truth is your problem is very simple. God said it. You didn't prepare your heart to seek the Lord. You didn't prepare what do you mean prepare? Well, you didn't get ready to seek the Lord. You didn't prepare your heart to seek after God. You didn't uh, take time to think about some things. Make ready, prepare. Okay, you, you know, we, we prepare a garden, right? Um, you normally would till the soil, right? Grind it up. You fertilize it sometimes. You dig that little hole and you plant some seeds right there. And sometimes, by the way, you you're not preparing it right. Remember my tomato story? If 10-10-10 fertilizer, if you use one cup of 10-10 fertilizer for this amount of area, you know certainly five cups will make it better. <laughs> Sprinkle that all over there, and then your tomatoes die. Why? Because you didn't prepare. You didn't think. You didn't uh, set it in a, in a good spot, the soil in a good spot. And so you didn't do right. And, you know, part of your life, part of my life, your future is requiring you, if you want to have a good future, you don't want to be a mess, is to simply prepare your heart. In other words, get your heart ready for something. And it tells you exactly what for. But prepare your heart. Get your heart ready for what? To seek the Lord. Okay. An illustration. You're going to get married someday, young folks. So preparing your heart, Lord, it doesn't matter what I want because marriage comes from you. And God, in reality, I 
don't have the wisdom to know who I should marry. But God, you've given me a mom, a dad, a pastor, and they love you. Help them to guide me and direct me and, and lead me in the right path. Lord, it doesn't matter what I want. It matters what you want. And all of a sudden, you're preparing your heart for whatever the Lord wants. You know, that, that's what the Bible says, the, the Lord's Prayer, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed by, be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Every day you're preparing your heart for what? To do the will of God. And, and you know, Roboam's simple uh, problem is he did not prepare his heart to seek the Lord. It goes for us 45-year-olds. It goes for the 60-year-olds, the 70-year-olds, the 80-year-olds. It goes for the 20-year-olds. But I, I have a burden for the young folks. Well, you have your life right in front of you, and there's a path to go on. You can go to the right, you can go to the left. If right is the right way to go, and that's the Lord's will, that's the way you want to go. Often you have the old men, the old women, saying, do the Lord's will. Prepare your heart to seek God. Then you'll have a young buckaroo counselor who says, it doesn't matter. Don't you know you're 15 years of age? <laughs> you're 16 years of age. You know everything. No, please, 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 please. Reboam, you got yourself in a mess. How did it happen? Well, you didn't seek, prepare your heart to seek the Lord. You listened to the wrong people, Reboam. You didn't know how to do it, You didn't understand the importance of marrying a godly woman. You forsook the Lord. You lived a wishy-washy life. I wish I'd learned from my mistakes. That boat, I think that was you, Brother Wilson, your eyes like this. But my wife is smart. We go get a mattress. I have no straps. So I said, honey, it'll be okay. It's only a few blocks away. I'll just put it on top of our vehicle. No, honey, are you sure? Yeah, trust me, honey. So we're driving down Kempsville Road, and all of a sudden, the mattress is flying through the air. And I, once again, go like this. What have I done? I'm in a mess again. Has it happened before? Yes. We leave church. We only live two, or two, two blocks away from, from church off of Indian River Road. We've got some, I think it was Patch the Pirate Club stuff or some club things, and my wife wants me to take care of it. We don't have much room in the vehicle. I said, Sonny, we'll set it on the roof. Everything will be all right. Honey, are you sure? I don't think that's a good idea. Trust me, honey. I know. I set it up there. As soon as you turn on Indian River Road right there, right outside the church, and you have traffic stopped in all directions, things going everywhere. What a mess. What a mess. Now, has that happened to me? Yes. One, two, three, four. Now, that's bad, and it is bad. However, your life is much more precious than that, spiritually speaking. And, you know, that, that is funny. It's not right. I should learn from it. I think I have. I hope I have. But, but your spiritual life, as far as where you're going to go in life, of living for the Lord or not living for the Lord, it matters. It matters, Pastor, taking an extra 10 minutes tonight and mentioning it in the sermon. Because your life matters to God. And, and I beg you and I plead with you to read this points, so we're done. What happened, Rebom? Well, Rebom, you didn't prepare your heart to seek the Lord. You listened to the wrong people. You didn't know how good you had it. You didn't understand the importance of marrying a godly woman. You forsook the Lord and you lived a wishy washy life. Let's learn from Rebom. Let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, we love you. In a reality, it's not a hard message. When we prepare our heart to seek the Lord, our heart loves a message like this because we know it's true. God, I pray that you help our church folks to be reminded of this constantly. Boy, that little decision is not such a little decision. It's a big decision. Help us to listen to the right people. And I, and I pray that some of the young people, if they are asked their opinion, they say, hey, what do I know? 
Go and talk to mom. Go talk to dad. Go talk to the pastor. And Lord, I pray that you help us to not be wishy-washy. Help us to realize how good we have it. I pray that the young folks, they really think about marrying a godly man or a godly woman. I pray that they prepare their heart to seek you, God. We love you. Thank you for giving us the nitty-gritty details of Rehoboam. In Jesus' name, amen. Stand